Thank you. Cool. There you go. All right. Some are good? Excellent. Well, good afternoon. So I like to do this as a fairly interactive. So if you want to be part of this, come closer. Uh, so I can answer questions and so on because I work more like that than just standing up here lecturing. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, my, the request here for my time was to talk about harvesting plants and so on, but I, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about why you might work with these medicines as well as how. Uh, and I'm assuming that people have questions, so just put your hand up if you need to know something or if what I'm saying is not clear. So as the, intro as the introduction said, I've been doing this for a long time now. Uh, I was unwell about 30 years ago and basically the journey of putting myself back together has ended up here with me working with the plant medicines. Uh, I have wild land, as was mentioned, outside of Aurelia. It's in a wildlands provincial park, so I know the medicines are clean there. The river actually travels down from just outside of Algonquin, mostly through green space and on into the top of Lake Simcoe and Lake Kuchichin. That's that particular Black River. There are several Black Rivers in Ontario, so we best get the, the one clear which one it is. So I'm a vendor at the St. Lawrence Market. I harvest from my property and from South Central Ontario, Northern Quebec. I've traveled everywhere to do this work and to learn from various people. I've tromped across fields and through forests with a lot of different folks uh, learning kind of what it is that I know now. I've been 12 years at the St. Lawrence and I've made a place for the local medicines there. So you can always find me there if you want to follow up from this conversation. So to me, we work with the plant medicines from here because that's how we connect to the land. And to me, if we want to be well, we want to connect to the land where we live. Medicines grow everywhere. You can walk out your front door, you can look at your lawn, you can look through the garden and all of those pesky weeds that you pull out that are not something that you necessarily want to be growing there. And you can think, oh my goodness, these things, they just drive me crazy. Well, I caution you and urge you to look again. Because I had to stop pulling things out of my garden as I discovered that the things that were coming in, all of those unexpected things, they were the medicines. And they were trying to come and be with me. So I had to stop pulling them out. So that's been very much part of the learning for me. So if you find things like motherwort, it's a very simple uh, herb or lamb's quarter or amaranth. These are things that I have at the table that I can show you. I have some other things here to show you as well. Uh, if you find these things in your garden, you need to get your field guide out and see what they might be. And I caution you in using uh, information. Where you get information on this subject is important. The internet can be a very valuable tool. Be careful about what's, what sites you're on to get information about using plants as medicine. Make sure that you can back that up, that you can back it up with a, a reference book that you can hold in your hand, that with someone who has some credibility and some, some background in working with plant material. I, was, um, I took up a book recently that was done by five or six different people that had been recommended to me by someone who worked in a, a medicinal greenhouse. And I only discovered very recently that none of those people work with those plants as medicine. They were all biologists. And that some of the information is wrong. So it's, it's important that you, you really watch your, watch your references, watch what, you, what you're learning from. And know that ultimately, you really need to walk across that field holding somebody else's hand. And so they can say to you, yes, that is the plant that you see in that book. You really must do that before you start using things as medicine. Okay, so enough of all of that. Medicines are everywhere, and I'm going to show you a couple of things that may surprise you. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a basket of mint. <clears throat> now many people, there's a lot of misunderstandings about mint, but it is a medicine. It's a stimulant, okay, it's to pick you up, it's to make you feel better, but if you're having digestive issues, it is not your friend. 
because mint can irritate. If there's already issues in your digestion, like if you have tears in the stomach lining or something like that, or your digestion is not functioning well, mint is not necessarily going to help you. You need something that's smoother, that's not going to stimulate your digestion, but is rather going to calm it. So I have another suggestion. So this, this is raspberry leaf. Now raspberry leaf, many of you may know, uh, raspberry canes. If you have a little bit of property, often the canes are the, the great big ones that kind of arch over and can be very difficult to get out of your property if you want to plant something else there. But as a medicine for your digestion, it's a perfect blessing. So this is how I harvest. I would take, I harvest a lot, of course, I harvest in great quantities, so I arm loads at a time. You, you yourselves may not need that much for your own purposes. But when I harvest raspberry cane, I would take it like this with several canes, tie them together and hang them up to dry in some place where the airflow is really good. So I have, uh, in my, my living room, I have a double set of curtain rods and I have windows that open both top and bottom. So the airflow there is fabulous. So I can dry an entire harvest of raspberry cane in about a week, like this. And then once it's dry, and this is what would happen here now, is that I would pull the leaves off and I'd end up with the cane, which is the, see I leave things wherever I go, look at that, eh? <laughs> Uh, I would end up with the long stick. You may have some of the smaller sticks that, that the leaves are attached to, but that's fine. You can take them out if you want. But that raspberry leaf is a digestive help. It eases gas. It can help the digestion to function. It also is usually known as a medicine for women. So it can be helpful for menopause issues it can be helpful at the other end for menstrual issues for cramps and that kind of thing because the way that it works for women is, is at a, a uterine stimulant so it's used in the latter stages of a pregnancy for example to help keep <laughs> to help the baby come right so it keeps your womb space kind of happening but the new information is also important that suggests this is an important herb for men I was just having a conversation with a man recently who talked to me about the fact that the cancer rates for men are actually higher than they are for women and that the most common cancer for men is prostate cancer. This is your friend, gentlemen. This is a preventative, okay? Because it's very grounding. That's what it does for women. It gets us into our womb space, into the lower part of our bodies. It does the same thing for men. So it can be a preventative for those kinds of issues. So you see that the difference between herbs and using plant material than using an individual medicine of a pharmaceutical type is that they have many different uses, the same plant. It has many different uses because you're using the whole plant. And we are whole beings. And one of the ways I always describe it is that plants and people are made with the same set of cosmic laws. So we can do this. Whereas pharmaceuticals are made with a different set of laws and they have to be very strong to get to us. And sometimes, in my opinion, they're a little too strong. So I would rather use these. So there's a lot of different other things that we might use and I'm gonna show you a couple others. So now this, whoops, this herb is known uh, primarily as an antidepressant. People know what this is? You recognize this? I'm going to pass it around, okay? Just have a look. It doesn't have much smell or anything. This is, this is St. John's wort. Yep. And St. John's wort is known in North America as an antidepressant herb. And for people that, that need that sort of help, it can be very useful. In Europe, it's used as a, a medicine for the, for the organs, particularly the liver and the kidneys, particularly the liver, actually. And the liver in our bodies can actually hold some of our emotions. So both things come together in the middle as that this is something that can make you feel better. 
Now, St. John's wort is a very interesting herb because it can be used in many different forms. So I also have an oil on the table. Now, the oil is also a medicine for the nervous system, but in a different way, because it can help. You know, the nerves are bundles, right? And they have what's called a sheath that, well, I guess the closest thing that I could describe that would be similar would be like the casing around a sausage. You know, it holds the meat together. Well, our nerves have something similar. They have a sheath around them. And if there's an accident or an injury, that sheath can be torn. St. John's wort as an oil made in the sun in olive oil can help to heal that. Okay? So, yep. Is it an invasive herb in the garden? No. That's an interesting question because this year on my land, I have more St. John's wort than I've ever seen there. I mean, like, we're talking five times the amount that's usually there. Now, in some situations, one might call that invasive. In my world, <laughs> I would think that that's the medicine, that's the plants talking to me, you know, because they know that that plant, like for years, I've thought, is it possible that the things that grow more in any one year are going to be needed in the winter months to come? Is that really possible? Does, does nature really do it like that? Well, I think she does. So I've had a number of pretty interesting experiences with the plant world recently, and certainly the St. John's wort on the land this year was one of them. The last time I was there, I was camping, and uh, we had just an unbelievable storm, kind of tent flapping all night, you know, thinking, oh my God, am I going to stay on the ground? You know, rain, the whole nine yards, like some of those pretty crazy storms we've had this summer. And I was there with another woman friend. Well, she got up, you know, really early in the morning and said, okay, we're out of here. I said, oh, wait a minute. I'm not ready to leave. I have things to do, places to go. So let's go get coffee in Wushego and we'll come back. No, no, I'm leaving. I was really upset. I wasn't ready to leave. I did have things to do. And I pulled my last tent peg up and there was a big piece of St. John's work came out with that, with that peg. And I thought, oh, oh, that is so cool. <laughs> she wants me not to be unhappy. <laughs> so, but the other example, I think, uh, this summer that really surprised me, uh, because I, I stock herbs. Uh, I don't know if that, that may be a term that's a bit strange, but I try to figure them out. I try to learn something new every season. And sometimes I have to look for the plants. I'm wild crafting, right? I'm not necessarily growing them in my garden. Although I have small gardens in Toronto, most of my practice is harvesting in the wilderness. So my land is in wilderness. I'm, in, I'm right beside a 356 hectare wildlands provincial park. So I harvest there. I also have friends who have properties way up in the Madawaska Valley on the other side of Algonquin. So I spend a lot of time there too. So I look for plants, I, I stock them, I, I try to figure out where they grow. So what are their circumstances? Are they wetland plants? Uh, do they grow in the swamps? Do they grow on the edge of the forest? Do they need sun? Are they in the open fields? And so on. So I kind of follow all of those things. And last year I missed the fireweed because that's the thing when you're not out of town all the time and living where the plants grow, your timing's got to be really good uh, to be able to get them because some plants, when they're ready, they're ready. And you may only have a window of two or three weeks uh, to get that plant at its prime. So I, the last two years I've run. But this, last year I missed the fireweed. I was a little bit too late. And that is the medicine for prostate issues for men. It's an anti-inflammatory herb, so it's also very helpful for people who are having issues of pain in the body. And I only had a small amount of it, sort of maybe the width of this room on the land, when I looked last year. This year when I went up there, that, that swath of fireweed was 100 feet long. And I thought, I had a native elder visit there this summer, someone that I've known for a long time, but we've only recently started to work together. And I was telling her about my theory about, you know, that the plants that grow more are the ones we're going to need in that winter. And she said, so what's going to happen this winter? And I said, well, I'd say that we're going to have a lot of depression and a lot of inflammation, is what I'd say. <laughs> so, so far so good is from what I'm seeing. 
Because one of the things that happens at the, um, at the St. Lawrence Market is that I get this really interesting slice of humanity come by that table. You know, I meet people from all over the world, all walks of life, uh, young, old, every, every possible combination of folks that you can imagine. And I've always made a practice of reaching out to people as they go by the table because I serve tea. And I make a practice of, of bringing in the people who are a little shy or maybe, uh, maybe a person who's not of uh, Canadian origin, so they might need a little more encouragement. And that, that has been a remarkable experience uh, over the, the many years that I've been there now. Twelve years, I never would have believed, eh? <laughs> I didn't imagine that I would end up doing this, but, you know, here we are. Life is strange sometimes. So... Okay, what else have I got here? I'm going to show you a couple other things, and then I'm going to, I want some questions, okay? So this is a, this is a really interesting plant. Uh, this can be a bit invasive in the garden, but for me, you know, I just figure that means I, means I need more of it. Um, this is in the uh, Artemisia family. The way that, that plants go is that you would have uh, a Latin name, which is usually the family name of the plant, uh, and that would be the first word in any kind of combination of plants. So if you're looking it up in a book, that's what you're seeing. The first word is the family, and the second one is which, which member of the family. So whether it's the uncle or the aunt or whomever. So this is an Artemisia, but it's a mugwort. Now, mugwort, this is where the, the pagans who come to the table, they all want to know if I have mugwort. Uh, because this is an ancient magical herb in several different traditions in the world. I'm going to pass it around so you can smell and touch and check it out. But it's also, it's also a medicine in the Orient. So if people have ever heard of moxibustion, when you're being used in acupuncture and so on, well, this is the herb that it's made from. Uh, so... You know, when you, when you look at the earth and where the plants grow and how they grow, you think we're in the north temperate zone from the equator, right? We're in this part of the world. So if you follow that thread around, that includes parts of Europe, uh, it includes parts of Asia, uh, and so on. And, and the plants are common because plants don't only grow in one continent or another, they grow relative to the weather conditions in that part of the continent. So we might have different plants, in fact we do have different plants grow in the north of Ontario than we do in this area, just as the forests would have been different. And that's part of the learning about how you figure out herbs, you know, you want to know about where they grow because that can give you clues as to who they are as a medicine. So I'm going to give you an example of that. Now this is an herb called sweet fern, and this is one of the teas that I'm serving at the table in the other room today. Now this is a northern Ontario plant. Uh, and I'm going to pass it around. You can, you can see that it has a leaf that looks very much like a fern, you know, with those fluffy kind of lacy things that you see in the forest in the spring. But it has a woody stem. So it doesn't grow in the forest. It grows out on the open shield of the, of the Canadian shield. Now, the Canadian shield you know, is, is granite, right? It's granite and crystals and, and that black rock that was formed by fire. And it's been scraped down by massive glaciers and put back together in what we see in Ontario now. So this plant grows out on that open area where you might find water in the spring uh, because it likes wet feet in the spring. It doesn't necessarily want to have wet feet all the time, so it's not going to grow in the wetland, but it's going to grow just up the hill from the wetland where it gets the water in the spring. So it's strong, you know, it stands out there in the heat of the sun. Thank you. Because trust me, when you're harvesting out on the Canadian Shield and it's, you know, 80 or more out, you, you know that it's hot. And that plant just soaks it up. And this year, see I harvested that about three weeks ago because we've had so much water this year 
it's still growing. Normally it would dry up by the end of, end of July at the outside. Uh, but this year, because we've had so much more water, it's, it's still there. So I, I know from the experience of that plant growing that it's going to support us in a big way. It's going to support our immune system. It brings that strength from being out on the Canadian Shield into itself to offer us as a tea. So that's one of the ways that you can, thank you, one of the ways that you can learn about the plants is to look at where they grow. And then some plants you can look at what they look like and that can tell you something as well. Okay, so, oh, that one here. Now in terms of, of harvesting plants, like I harvest, like this is fresh. This was harvested on Friday, I took this to the market. So, and uh, basically what I would do with this now is that I would take several, several stalks, not too many, say like about so, and I would line them all up because you want everything to, to uh, dry the same, right? So now you're going to make, when you're doing this, you're going to make every set of stalks the same because you want them to dry the same, right? So you got to pay a little bit of attention to that. And then I would take... I use, I use ribbon because I have so much of it. I wouldn't necessarily suggest that, but I, um, I helped someone clean out a space one time and I ended up with a, a lifetime supply of ribbon. So I, uh, I do use it. It's not the best because sometimes it stretches actually. And what you really want, you really want to work with cotton string and stuff like, like butcher twine. It's actually better and more reliable in terms of how it holds. Now what you have to know about plants is that they're two-thirds water. So as they dry, they're going to lose volume. So when you tie this up, it's got to be tight uh, because chances are really good, if not, that it's going to slip right out of there by the time it's dry. So that's one bundle. I probably have another eight or so there. I would hang these all up in a row on, in front of my windows where they can open out of the sun. You don't want these to be in the sun again because if you put them in the sun at this point, the sun is going to take all the energy out of the plant. You want it for yourself, right? So, so you're going to want to put it in a place where there's really good airflow, but it's in the shade. And that can be outside or inside. If you've got a good place outside, then by all means. At this time of year, because most of us have our heat on, uh, things dry very quickly. So you have to watch that because you don't want them to be crispy, okay? I want them to be brittle. They still should have a feel to them. Like this, this one still does. It's, it's a little drier than it might be if I harvested this earlier, but it still has some oils in it. And that's what you want. That's the medicine, right? So then what you do is you hang these all up and you get them dry. And then I take them all apart. Do as much of that work as you can with your hands. You know, in some traditions, you don't use any metal on medicines. That's really not possible for me. Uh, I can't break that some of those stems up on the sweet fern with my hands, or if I do, it hurts. Uh, I've actually started wearing gloves harvesting. I've never done that before, but I've hurt myself too often. So I also bought myself a pair of uh, uh, completely reliable shoes. <laughs> no open toes, you know. You don't want to be stubbing, uh, after years of stepping in the wasp nests and, you know, falling and all kinds of stuff, I don't do that anymore. I'm getting older and a little smarter, I think. <laughs> so I'm trying to protect myself now. So uh, I'm being more careful. So then what you want to do is you want to break this up or chop it up as need be and put it in a paper bag. And the real secret to all of this is you must label the paper bag. You must, okay? Trust me. I can show you bags of things. Oh, I don't even know what that is. Oh, that root is completely distinctive. I don't know what that is. Well, I don't. <laughs> I have unidentified some things in every category of what I do. <laughs> so, and sometimes that's just because the label on a bottle ran. You know, I didn't use ink. I used a, a marker. And 
can't read it when it gets wet. So I would really strongly suggest that you label everything. And then you're going to know what it is, because by the time you chop this up a bit, it's going to look like about 20 other different things. So, And if unless it has a really distinctive smell, like mint or something like that, you're really not going to know the difference. Okay? So I'm going to stop there, because I think that's a little bit of an introduction. But I'm really hoping there's questions. I have a question. Yep. Um, I have a, uh, this year I experimented with lemon balm, and I wanted to dry it. You can't let yes, you can. Uh, let, she's asking about lemon balm, and I, I just have to say that lemon balm is an excellent medicine, but you must take care of it in your garden, because otherwise it will take over your garden, uh, because it both travels by root and it drops seeds. So if you don't, the peak of harvesting lemon balm is when the leaves are still there and the flowers have just come out. Not when the flowers are fully out and have been out for a time, because that's where the seeds are. They're going to come right after the flowers, so that means that you're going to have more lemon balm next year than you have this year. But it is a nervine, okay? So which means that it's soothing for the nervous system, and it's completely safe. So it is a safe, everyday tea for most people to help keep you calm. It'll even, for most people, it can get them calm enough if they have a cup of tea after dinner to be able to go to sleep. So, and if that isn't enough, it'll get you going in the right direction. So in terms of harvesting lemon balm, when you've got the flowers on it and it's bigger, it actually can be this big. And if you can find with your hands and go back to the original, the, the main central piece and snip there, you'll end up with a little more of a clump, right? So you can do that, and then if you've got a clump, and lemon balm will go out like this. So, you know, if you've got that central stem, you can just tie that up as, as the bunch. If you need to go and get the little pieces, you can do that. It can be very time consuming to tie them all up. So just get yourself a wicker basket and dry it in the wicker basket. You know, for most of you, unless you're doing the kind of quantity that I'm doing, the whisker basket drying method would be fine. The, the art of that is get the pieces so they fit in the basket, put a label on them somewhere so you remember. If there are little pieces that you're going to lose through the holes in the wicker basket, put a tea towel or a cloth underneath, and then move them around a little bit. You know, just turn them over every day or so. Well, at least once a day, you should play with them a little bit. Uh, I often have stages of drying in my world, so I may get things partially dry by hanging them up, but then they start to fall apart and they start to fall out of the ribbon, so I take them down, and then I may do a second stage of drying in a basket, because I, I have an awesome collection of baskets. Do you know that people leave baskets on their front lawns? I figure they're just for me. <laughs> they put them out in the garbage at the end of the sidewalk. Oh, there's another one. Isn't that lovely? It sounds like me a present. So, but I have many ways of finding baskets. But that has been fairly consistent. Because I think a lot of people get baskets thinking they're nice, but then they become one of those things that kind of clutter up your place unless you're using them. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is a way to use them. <laughs> okay, what's next? Yep. Can you tell me about comfrey? Oh, comfrey. <gasps> It's an old name was knit bone. Uh, comfrey is, uh, there's different kinds of comfrey. So you have, yeah? In my garden, I have comfrey and they have purple flowers. Okay, so you have the Russian comfrey. Okay. Uh, which is a particular strand that Richter's uh, uh, greenhouse in particular has been propagating for many years. There is a common comfrey uh, here in our world that if it escapes from a garden, can take over a woodland. Now, it's, you know, it's beyond invasive. However, there's purpose here, because comfrey is like a green fertilizer. So if it spreads like that in a woodland area, that's because that land needs the green fertilizer that the plant has to offer. But as a medicine for people, uh, its old name is knit bone, and it is known to heal broken bones. Uh, it's used generally now in creams and so on. That's how I use it. Uh, I don't use it internally. 
um, there is a lot of dispute about how to use comfrey and whether or not it's safe for people. And that comes from uh, tests done in, in laboratories on animals. I, I would question those uh, because often when that kind of testing is done, it's with a part of the plant, not the whole. But it also, it also is, uh, I'm just thinking how to describe, it's a tissue regenerator. So it can actually build new tissue. That's what it's doing when it heals broken bones. So if you have cancer tissues in your body, it will also help those to grow. So you want to either know that or be or be not taking it internally. What, is it the root, the flower, the leaf, or the whole thing? The flower is a flower remedy for dealing with trauma. I do vibrational flower remedies. I have my own set. I use country a lot. Uh, it is for healing trauma from this life and from past lives on an energetic level. The creams and oils, the, it's made as a hot infusion generally, uh, which is in a double boiler kind of system. You chop up the leaf, you cover it with olive oil, and you basically keep the water underneath going at a gentle simmer for about three or four hours. And the comfrey leaf and flower and stem that you've chopped up in the olive oil will give its medicine to the oil. You squeeze it out, put it through a strainer, squeeze it through cheesecloth, whatever you can do. Um, and the, the country itself can go into your compost or into your garden directly. Um, and you use the oil as the medicine. So the root, however, is the best medicine. So at this time of year is when you want to go for your roots because the plants start to die back. And when you're using plants as medicine, Sucks the juices into it. Right. When you're using plants as medicine, you want to know where the energy of that plant is at that time of year. So either in the very early spring or in the fall, it's in the root, right? So things are dying back now. So if you remember where your echinacea is, this is the time to do the echinacea. I'll come to that, back to that. But the country root is the best medicine. If anyone in your family has an issue uh, with a sprain or a strain or even a hairline fracture, like an actual break, you take that root and you slice it up and you put it on the body part like a cast and it will heal that break faster than a cast. Uh, so now not many people do that anymore. You know, we're a bit cautious uh, about using some of these things as medicine, but that was how it was done. At one point in, in the, the height of, of, uh, of European herbalism, every woman had comfrey in their garden. Uh, and even if you wrap the leaf around like a poultice, it will make a difference. So that's how you use comfrey. And at this time of year, it's, it's important to, to take some of that now. Uh, it is, a, as I said, a green fertilizer. I think it's actually saved my magnolia tree because it grows underneath it. Uh, so it has helped as the, it cut, I cut it back a lot, you know, if the leaves get discolored and so on, I just continually cut it back so it goes right back into the soil and the garden. So it's an awesome herb and I would, I would really recommend people work with it, but be careful which kind you've got. And as I said, the Russian comfrey is less invasive and less likely to spread. So let me talk a bit about echinacea just because I'm onto the root things. If people have got echinacea in their garden, uh, this is the time to dig it up. Now, echinacea flowers in the second year, right? It's an every second year kind of thing, a biennial, like many plants in our world. And the roots, when you dig it up, will have a mother root, will be like the fist, and it will have daughters, like the fingers, right? So you take the mother root, the biggest piece of that echinacea plant, and you take the daughters off and you replant the daughters and you'll have flowers next year so already one year so next year will be two and you use the main part of that root for your tincture and if you have echinacea in your garden i would strongly suggest that you make some basically the concept behind uh, uh, making tinctures is you wash the roots as well as you can and that's easier said than done uh, you really have to work at it sometimes um, I try to keep most roots, unless they're really large, intact. Like I don't chop them into small pieces. Echinacea, that can be a chunk. 
So you are going to want to slice that up a bit. Uh, and it'll make it easier to fit in the jar. I generally use mason jars for just about everything to do with medicines because they're, they're accessible. I can, I can uh, clean them uh, just like you would for canning and so on. You can clean them just like that. They take hot water. You remember to put the spoon in. You don't break it. Uh, the, the lids are, you can find the lids, you know, and so on. So I have all kinds of mason jars and it's the only jar that I don't recycle. Uh, I put everything else in the recycling and I reuse all of the mason jars. So you want the alcohol <laughs> to be more than the bulk of the earth. Now you, there are particular quantities and so on that you can work with, but the general rule of thumb is that you want at least one and a half times as much alcohol as you have a root. Okay, so it has to, the root has to be completely covered. If it's not covered, that little part of the root that sticks out of the alcohol will turn the whole thing, potentially. But it will definitely rot. It will not rot if you put it in alcohol. I use brandy. Basically, brandy and vodka are the most commonly used uh, alcohols to make tinctures. Personally, I, I, I don't like vodka. I don't like the smell of it, so I don't want to work with it. Uh, and I also didn't want the, um, the grain component. And I know you can get potato vodka, but it's a little harder. Maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not my preference. I work with brandy. It's aged in an oak cask. The vibration of oak is for strength and longevity. I like that. So I'm okay if that goes into my medicines. Um, it's a little more palatable when you're using it as tinctures and so on. And if you're making something like a valerian root tincture, that can be important. Because valerian root does not taste good. It doesn't smell good either. <laughs> That's how you know you have valerian tincture. Um, there are some that you want that are very high in a sugar component, so you want to watch that. And sometimes the vodka. Pardon? Two minutes. Okay. You want to watch that in terms of um, uh, how much sugar you're actually putting in. Generally, you, you, a 40% alcohol is enough, but then you're going to use it straight. You will dilute it and water it down later, not when you're making the tincture. Okay, that's how you can keep it really safe. I'm giving you simple and safe, okay, so that you can do it. I want these medicines to be accessible. That is my purpose in doing this. I'm at the St. Lawrence Market because it's frontline education for potentially 8,000 people who come through there on a Saturday morning. So that's been my commitment to the plants and to bringing people back to the land. I do three kinds of classes just for future reference. One on the herbs, one on the flower remedies, and one on healing. I'm a craniosacral practitioner. I have Reiki and shamanic training, so my body work is very powerful. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know a few things. So I'm really happy to pass it on. As someone said to me today, if you don't pass knowledge on, it ceases to be knowledge, right? So it's been a struggle getting this information. It's more available than it's ever been. When I started 12 years ago, it was not available. Uh, so it's important that we pass this around, that we have communication and that we come together around this. It's important that we look at the plants and what's happening in Ontario because we are losing them. Don't be concerned about what's going on in the Amazon. Look in your backyard because we are losing our wetlands, we are losing our forests, and that means we are losing our medicines. Our medicines, okay? And that's important. They, the plants want us to be there with them. They, they're waiting for us to notice. They're waiting for us to use them. So I'd say let's do that. So if you're interested in any of those things, my Facebook page is Black River Gatehouse. Because I'm on the Black River, I'm right at the edge of the park, so I am the Gatehouse. So that's my company name. My other names are Linda Rose. I have others that come after that. I don't use those because everybody knows how to spell Linda Rose. So thank you so much for having me.